my message this morning, or this afternoon, nearly, nearly did it. Um, I'm good at that, aren't I? Uh, you, everybody is waiting for it to happen. So as we talk about Barnabas, I saw him as a study in grace and persistence. And this is all about approaching 2024. The service is really about how we might approach the new year in the way we live and what we do. You know, sometimes, and I think, you know, Bev and I have discussed it a fair bit about what we're thinking about in 2024, where are we going? Is it a sense of foreboding for you, a sense of the unknown, sense of anxiety? How should we as Christians look forward to the new year? It may not be easy, but I'm going to suggest those two words to you in our prayers and our plans would be grace and persistence. And to do that, I thought that I would talk on Barnabas a bit because um, I was just fascinated when I was searching out his life. Unlike Paul, Peter, John, he had no writings. And so when we see these other people, we get a sense of who they are because of what they're saying. But Barnabas has no writings, so we don't, it's very hard to pick up what's behind his thoughts. But he's very important. When you trace his path in the ministry in the, in the early church, you find out that he's very important. I thought almost you could say, if you looked at the things that he did outside of Jesus, he could have even been one of the, the most important people in in the church at that time and we start off we see him in Acts chapter 4 and it comes and Luke says this Joseph a Levite from Cyprus whom the apostles called Barnabas which means son of encouragement sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles feet so Joseph was a Levite he likely studied under Gamaliel, the same as Paul, and he followed the Levitical path of teaching. He was a Jew from Cyprus, and I pondered why did he appear when he appeared? What did he hear in Cyprus that may have brought him to Jerusalem at that time? And I'm, I'm guessing he very clearly thought in the scriptures about the promises of a Messiah coming. He heard on the grapevine, if you like, um, about this guy in Jerusalem and the area. And he came over to Jerusalem and became a disciple, a follower of Jesus. There is a tradition that says he was one of the 72 who was sent out. Is it fact or not? It doesn't matter, but it would be true to say that he was a devout follower. He must have, in that timing, seen Jesus and must have been around. I believe that he was converted by knowing he'd seen the Messiah. He didn't just appear from nowhere because Luke brought him into the picture very early in his record of the new church. And he wrote Barnabas into the narrative of the church right through the last parts of Acts. This Joseph became Barnabas. Is it often in these times it seems people were given nicknames. You know, they, they changed their name. And, and this Joseph, for who, whoever he was and what he was doing, doing, they gave him the name Barnabas, a son of encouragement. And of all his characteristics that we look at, this is important to me as us as Christians being great encouragers of the people around us. So he is, he's mentioned in, in Acts and, and in Colossians and he's mentioned as an apostle of Jesus, which means he was pretty much trusted and believed and he being defined as a, an apostle was very important in the early church. He was a bridge between the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch and outside, the church to the Gentiles. 
And that, for us, is very, very important. Just as some facts, he's mentioned 23 times in Acts and five times in the epistles of Paul. So he was really fundamental, a cousin of John Mark. And he, with Paul and John Mark, created this uh, relationship that obviously, if you read through, the, through Acts, it was a bit shaky at times, but Barnabas kept it all going as we see later on in, um, in the fact that he and Paul were re, reunited in, in believing in each other and it was a time, I think, of, of upset in Barnabas's life when, when that happened. Barnabas left Jerusalem in the early days and went to Antioch and he, when he was in Antioch, he became the base of the preaching and development of the church there. He was the one who went to Tarsus and encouraged Saul. He accepted Saul, who was called by God and by Jesus, even though at that time he hadn't received the anointing of the church in Jerusalem. And in Luke, it starts off, it was Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul, and then suddenly, as it goes on, it's Paul and Barnabas. So Barnabas was stepping back to let Saul take his lead, and he was happy to do that. And I think that's one of the characteristics that we see in Barnabas. He would have seen everything. And in Acts 11, verse 24, it says this about Barnabas. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. There's a lot to be thought about with Barnabas, and this is my, you know, I got to the stage here of thinking about who was this Barnabas. I wanted to think, I was saying to John earlier, I was trying to picture who he looked like, but there was this person of Barnabas that was so rich in all of the things that he did and I think there are so many things and I just wanted to bring for us in considering this year about what we might glean from Barnabas. And I've got six points, really. Um, and the first point is Barnabas was a servant of the gospel. He went where the Holy Spirit sent him. He went to Tarsus. He went back to Jerusalem. He spent a year in Antioch with Paul and he really served God as a servant and we know nothing of what he wrote but we know that in that period the church in Antioch grew. And in the same way, over the 2,000 years, the gospel has been spread throughout the world by men and women who have been called by God to be servants and presenting Christ to the people wherever they went. Some of them are famous, we know, I love to quote all the famous ones, and, but some of them are un, unknown to us, but they are known to God. People like Barnabas, who we see mentioned by name so often, but he was loved by God and there are a lot of people unknown to us that are loved by God and serve God. So there are many ways for us to be a servant of the gospel. And I challenge myself and all of us to think about servanthood and how we may consider all the ways that we can be a servant to God and to Christ within our circumstances in the way we seek to serve God. We need to be led by God's Spirit into increasing the care and the love of those around us, those that we know and those that we don't know, and share his gospel. Second point I'd say is that Paul uh, Barnabas was a mentor. He mentored Paul, he helped Paul, and he helped, obviously, a lot of people in the church and he worked, as I said, with his cousin John Mark and brought him into a maturity who ended up writing the Gospel of Mark. And it's not hard for me to imagine thinking about Barnabas and really studying him that Paul would have turned so often to him 
for advice as they travelled on their missionary journey. They went around together. They were, as it says in Acts 13, they were worshipping and fasting and the Holy Spirit said, set them apart, Paul, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I have called them. We can find many times in our lives when someone needs our support, especially in their Christian growth. Important time for younger members and believers to receive advice and mentoring from an older believer like some of us here. But our job is, when we meet people, is to bring the sharing of the gospel and to introduce people to Jesus through our life ourselves. Generosity. We talk a lot about generosity. Barnabas had the spirit and the pattern of financial generosity. He was the first mention, as we mentioned earlier, was when he sold a field to give to the church to help the people in the, the apostles in presenting the gospel in Jerusalem. Our spirit of generosity must also be extended beyond financial giving as it did in Barnabas's case. We need the generosity to be helping others, especially those in need. Defining the needy in the society, it's not just the needy of financial assistance, but those who are lonely, dispossessed, depressed, missing the joy of life that can only be fulfilled by knowing God. It's what I, I love, you know, struggling along at the moment with my knee. <laughs> As my wife keeps saying, you look so grumpy and you don't look happy. And I said, well, I'm not really happy. But I can say that I'm trusting God and the joy of the Lord is within me, even though it's sometimes not on my face, according to Bev. Point four is forgiveness. Barnabas was quick to forgive. He faced that disagreement we talked about earlier with Paul. Their, their relationship survived the test of time. This is one of my strong pictures about Barnabas. This is Barnabas. He was the for, forgiver. He may have been an encourager, but it's somewhere I have this feeling of Barnabas being someone who forgives. And I consider the greatest gift from God after love is the gift of forgiveness because his love is based on the gift of the sacrifice of his son who saved us, saved us for the forgiveness of our sins. And I see in my, as I say, in my spirit, I really see Barnabas as a real forgiver in the church. Point five is a recognition of his humbleness. His willingness to step aside and see spiritual anointing in others. And for me, this aligns with a humbleness to accept God's leading wherever he takes you and just work for Jesus. Just whatever God puts in front of you, do it in the name of Jesus and work for Jesus. Barnabas saw in Paul the true calling of God, of Jesus in Paul, and he supported Paul throughout the ministry with humbleness. Humbleness with humility were the traits of Jesus in his ministry. Everything deferred to Father God. And he did nothing except in the name of Jesus, of, of his father. Point six, Barnabas was an encourager, as we said. Despite of all the relationships, Paul was there for everybody around him, for those specifically, Paul, John, Mark. But we see, easily, easily see that personal relationships can lead to difficulties and conflict. 
but I think Barnabas was one of those people that handled conflict and differences of opinion with grace. As I said earlier, a study in grace and persistence. It's important for us in everyday life to be an encourager. Especially important to encourage the people around us, as I said earlier. So these are just six points that I saw. I, I think I had a list of 10 or 12 points that I'd sort of gleaned in meeting my friend Barnabas, as I now call him my friend. So moving on, I ask you this question. How do you define success in your life? And just what does that mean? I was recently, at the end of last year, I, um, I read an article that was talking about defining success in the life of two men. And it was 22nd of November last year. It was the 60, 60th anniversary of the death of John F. Kennedy and C.S. Lewis. Both passed away on the same day. 60 years last November. By most measures, both would be considered enormously successful. In a, in a recent Gallup poll, Kennedy was rated the highest rated past president. At the time he, was, he died, he had a net worth of 300 million. In 2015, his estate was estimated at 1.2 billion. C.S. Lewis, achieved remarkable success. He was a genius, receiving three firsts from Oxford, the equivalent of graduating uh, summa cum laude three times. He served on the facility, on the, on the faculties of Oxford and Cambridge. Interestingly, quite apart from all of this, he played Scrabble with his wife in five different languages. I thought that's what you do with your spare time. He attained national fame for his radio talks on the BBC during World War II. He was featured on the cover of Time magazine in 40, 1947. More than 200 million copies of his books have been sold. His home is known as the Kilns, modest house where he lived, wrote and died. He gave away most, if not all, of the proceeds of his book often making donations anonymously, never bought a car, never learned to drive. He put his money into an Agape fund to don and donated much, so much of his money that a friend told him, keep a third for taxes because he was giving it all away. So why am I telling you that? Because I want to ask, how did Barnabas define success. And this is what I think. By serving the Lord and serving the people, Barnabas leaves no lasting message from himself. The message from Barnabas is a life well served. Barnabas defined, defined success in the same way that God define it, defines it. His measure is very different from the world. Success in God's eyes, is faithfulness to his calling. In Hebrews 3, 2, Jesus was faithful to the one who appointed him. Am I going the right way? Yes. Therefore, holy brothers, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and the high priest, whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him. Barnabas showed a life of servitude in the gospel through his witness for Jesus. He died as a martyr for Christ. I just want to share with you some words that I read talking about faith and talking about where we are. And the first is from Brother Geoffrey Tristram of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. And he notes, it is not great faith that you need, but faith in a great God. Faith is like a window you look through. 
It doesn't matter if the window is six feet high or six inches or just the tiniest peephole in a telescope. What matters is the God that your faith is looking out upon. So it may not be for us to reach martyrdom like Barnabas, but it is good to have our life modelled on his life. And I just put these together just to remind us. In, our, in your life, in my life, in our life, be an encourager. Be a giver to God's work. Be humble in our walk with Jesus. Be a help to others. Be led by the Spirit to wherever he leads us in life. Be forgiving of others and always remember our own failings. Jesus calls us to defend the gospel. But most of all, we defend the gospel by our witness of Christ in our lives. Too often Christians rush to defend the faith but show nothing of the call of being a witness to Christ in our actions and in our deeds. So it is our life that the world sees. It is the way we act that the world sees and is it that model that Barnabas can give us. Henry Nguyen said, and this is about confidence, when you know yourself as fully loved, you will be able to give according to the other's capacity to receive. And you will be able to receive according to the other's capacity to give. You will be grateful for what is given to you without clinging to it and joyful for what you can give without bragging about it. You will be a free person, free to love. So this for me is a great summary of Barnabas and should be for us also. The encourager, I hope that the message from God encourages you in this 2024. And harking back, John F. Kennedy famously said, ask not what, you, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I would say, ask not what God can do for you, but what you can do for God and his kingdom today. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and then all things will be added unto you. And just in closing, these were some words I read this week when I'm looking around at what's going on in the world. And this was from a, a blog that I saw. It's all right. And I'll just read it out to you. And think and listen carefully. And don't laugh. <laughs> Since none of us knows when we will meet the Lord, the best way to live this new year is to be ready every day for that day. But this is not only so we are prepared for that day whenever it comes. It is also because being ready to meet Jesus today is the best way to live today. If you, knew you would be, if you knew you would meet your Lord through your death or his return next week, what would you change in your life this week? What sins would you confess? What would you stop doing or start doing? Whom would you forgive? Whose forgiveness would you seek? Doing each of these things is best for us even if we were guaranteed another 50 years of life on this planet. I believe this to be one reason we do not know the timing of our Lord's return. And it is this. So we can live our best life every day by living in the expectation of the day we meet him. And that's a great... That was a great blessing to me. I'm going to show you a, a short video. It talks about resolving to do something for Jesus. If Kathy, can you do that? Hopefully we'll have sound.